true to him above all else? What if that looked like something really hard? That seems okay hypothetically, right? Seems okay on the surface. Seems okay kind of, yeah, that, that makes some sense. I can do that. What if God shook up your belief system and lined you with him a little differently, told you to do something that was different than the rest of the world, different from the rest of your congregation, different from the rest of the people that you know, different from what you've grown up doing? What if? Well, he did that to us. And what that looked like for us was we were told to stop celebrating Christmas and Easter. Now, don't mishear me. When I tell some people that, they immediately think, oh, it's non Jewish. They don't believe in Jesus. They don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead. They don't believe those things. That couldn't be farther from the truth. Now, the fact of the matter is, is that the Bible specifically says that every man should make up his own mind when it comes to holidays. So I'm not up here preaching today that you should not do that. What I'm going to tell you is you need to make that decision up for yourself based on biblical principles and prayer, okay? That's where that portion of this message is going to end. But I'll tell you, that was hard. He called our family to it. We did it. It was hard. We went kicking and screaming. Did not want to do that. We felt that, you know, Christmas and Easter for us was a time to really hone in and focus on the Lord and worship him, and it was real. But if God says go left, I ain't going right. And I am not up here judging. I am not up here saying Christmas and Easter, shame, shame on you, burn your tree, and that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying listen to the Lord. If he tells you to do something hard, you do something hard. But through that came a bit of a blessing. We started looking into more earnestly some of the feasts and some of the things that are actually in the Bible about what to, what to worship and what to celebrate, rather. And we got to do things like Passover. And when you take and you do Passover, you celebrate Passover, and you do a Seder meal, if you look for Jesus while you're doing that, there can be a depth added to it like you could never, ever believe. Just a true depth of understanding. You can see all these pictures that unfortunately our Jewish brothers and sisters are missing throughout the things that they've done all their lives. Christmas and Easter for us, that was stuff we did all our lives. We woke up, we knew what to do Christmas morning, right? The Jews know what to do for Passover. They know what a Seder dinner is about. They know the symbolism. They know the story about what God did through Moses for the Israelites. They know all those things. They grew up with it. What they don't know is how much Jesus is pictured throughout all of those things. It's amazing. So, really want you to hear this. I believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's a foundation of my belief system. Because I don't celebrate Easter does not mean I don't celebrate the resurrection of Christ. I don't celebrate Christmas. It doesn't mean that I can't celebrate the fact that Jesus came to earth and was born flesh for me. I can celebrate that. So this Wednesday is prayer and worship. The following Wednesday is normally a Bible study. Instead of that Bible study, we're going to have a Seder meal. We're going to go through and do discussion about a lot of the symbolism. We're going to go through the story of how God took the Israelites out of Egypt by using Moses. We're going to find Jesus all the way through. Come. Um, Wednesday the 24th. I know we've got some visitors here today that are here for the ordination afterwards. Thank you for coming, but you're invited. 
If you haven't taken part in a Seder meal before, come. Come find Jesus in it. I'm not going to try to convince you not to do Easter and Christmas that day. I'm going to teach you what Seder points to for Jesus, how Jesus fulfilled the Passover. Jesus fulfilled. Jesus became our Passover lamb. The Bible says that directly. So, talk a little bit more about that that Wednesday. But I would challenge you, if you haven't done it before, come and see. Just come and see. If nothing else, you're going to get a good meal and some good fellowship. Well, at least a good meal. Right? So, that said, those of you who normally come to our church, I'm going to let my wife talk a little. Please, you're better at it than I am with this stuff, so. Yes, works. Okay. Uh, we do have a sign-up sheet for anybody that's planning on coming. Um, so, you know, we, we kind of, we have, we have definitely made, made this uh, tradition our own. We've kind of done things, and, 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 and the Lord has shown me some interesting ways to kind of bring the, because we go through the plagues of Egypt. Um, so we have a list of things that you could sign up for. We're going to kind of do food along with that, and then we'll do what, what I call a scene two, where we actually do the Seder meal and go through all the elements of the actual Passover dinner. So it's a two-part thing. There's a lot of things to learn in it. Um, and like Sean was saying, um, you see Jesus all through it, but there's something else too. Um, in our Bible studies on Wednesday nights, we've been going through Revelation. And if you're familiar with Revelation at all, there are lots of things that are going to happen that have yet to happen. And a lot of those line completely up with the plagues of Egypt, water to blood, darkness, things like that. So we're not just looking at something that happened in the past. We're looking forward to something that's going to happen in the future. And our Jewish brothers and sisters who have been celebrating and doing this over and over and over again every year are going to start seeing these um, things happen when they come to pass in the end times and go, wait a minute, I've seen this before. It's going to be, so it's like, it's, it's all connected. It's all part of the one big Bible that we read and, and uh, know about. So anyway, so yes, so come Wednesday the 24th at 6 p.m. If you'd like to sign up to bring something, we have the sign-up sheet. If you have questions on what that looks like, come talk to myself or Sean, and we can, we can help you understand what it's all about. So, but it's a direct celebration of the resurrection of Christ because Jesus actually died at Passover, and we'll discuss the timeline and how all that happened. Good, good stuff. We're going to leave this up here on the music stand here. Come see it after. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. What an eloquent, perfect way God described what faith is for us. This scripture is Hebrews 11. This is the first verse in there. Hebrews 11 is often called the, the hall of faith, like hall of fame or um, heroes of the faith. And uh, we started a few weeks ago going through, uh, God put it on Crystal's heart that uh, we start talking about the heroes of the faith and we would end on Moses right before Passover because it all just fits perfectly, right? So to that end, next Sunday, we'll talk about Moses. It'll be the Sunday right before our Passover meal. This Sunday, we're going to talk about a couple other heroes of the faith and a couple that I don't think I've ever heard a sermon or even a message or anybody talk about these two heroes in the same story because they're kind of different. There's kind of a contrast between the two. We're going to talk about David, King David. We're going to talk about Samson. Samson was one of the judges. You remember, he's the guy that killed a bunch of people with the jawbone, had superhuman strength given to him by the Holy Spirit. You know, sometimes... Sometimes my message is, there's not a lot on my outline, but God does a lot. 
Sometimes there's a lot on my outline, but God cuts it in half. Right? So I've learned that whatever God gives me when I'm prepping, just be prepared. God has all the trump cards. He can change things. And I'm willing to do that today. There are some messages that feel like they're heavy on the spirit. Some messages heavy on the truth, spirit and truth, right? We see our signs up here, spirit and truth. That's one of the things God has been nailing into our head since my wife and I came and started doing worship here. We need to worship in spirit and truth. So this is one of those messages. It's heavy on the Bible, heavy on what I would call truth in that, in that regard, right? And so it kind of feels like, like a little bit like last week too, a little bit like a book report, right? I'm going to tell you what the book says. But the book says it better than I can, I can tell you that. But along the way, God revealed something to me, and I'll, I'll get back to that at the end, about these two men and how he used them and what the key difference was. Stay tuned. All right, so talking about these two, let's, you know, James 2.26 says, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Now, you know, we talked about the definition in Hebrews 1, what faith is for us. But you couple that with this statement, this truth about faith in our lives. You couple those together and you realize that faith is more than just saying, I believe. It's more than just a statement. The fruit of faith in this regard is movement. It's some works. You believe, do something. Do not hear, do not go and say, oh, that Pastor Sean, he said you have to have works to be saved. That is not what I'm saying. I'm saying if you're saved, there should be works. It's a fruit. That's not a requirement. It's not a checkbox out of here and you have to do something to be checked. No, Jesus did it all. He's the one that does anything for us to be saved. But once that we're saved, we're so incredibly thankful and we worship him to such an extreme that we can't help but walk out and do something. Right? Preach, he says. All right. Preach it. Ooh, this microphone works. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit here. Talk about kind of the beginnings for David and for Samson, right? In the Bible, First Samuel 13. No, Samuel was a prophet. He came to Saul, who was the king at the time. He was the king before David, right? But Saul messed some things up. We all know who Saul was, right? We all know he wasn't doing it right. And Samuel came to him and said, you have done foolishly for you have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, for now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel for now, forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for him, himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord commanded him to be commander over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Saul does not know David's name yet. He has not really met him. Doesn't know who that is going to be. Right here, Samuel heard and told Saul, there's coming, the man is going to take over your kingdom, you king, your kingdom is being taken away. It's going to be replaced by a man after God's own heart. Now, I know each of you have heard that David is the man that's after God's own heart. This is the prophecy of David. First Samuel 17. There's a war coming. These Philistines, not good people not friends to Israel. 
Chapter 17, verse 3, starting here. Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Goth, whose height was six cubits and a span. Cubit. There's different translations of what a cubit is. The best one I've found is roughly 18 inches. 18 inches for six cubits. So that's under 12 feet, between 11 and 12 feet somewhere, plus a span, which is like half a cubit. So we're talking just about 12 feet tall, this Goliath guy was, right? 12 feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his soldier, sold, shoulders. Bronze javelin back here, right? Now the staff of the spear was like a weaver's beam. His iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels. And the shield bearer went before him. So not only was he 12 feet tall, and we're talking 12 feet tall. You, we're not talking about a bean pole here. We're not talking about someone who's standing this way and just goes straight up you know, six foot. My son is six foot, what, two? Six foot one? So don't stand up. You're my sermon illustration, okay? So you picture him standing on his own shoulders all the way up to there. That's roughly 12 feet, right? But picture Goliath's leg being as thick as his torso right here and another leg right there. His midsection, his, his torso, and then his head up there. His head's probably, you know, this big around. We're talking about a big dude. Thank you, Derek. So we're not just talking about, you know, Derek standing on, him, on his shoulders, like thin. We're talking about massive mountain kind of man. So not only was he huge, he was well armed. We're talking about a spear, probably this thick, this big around, right? Like eight inches in circumference, uh, eight inch in uh, diameter. Thank you. About that big around. We're not talking about a small thing. We're not talking about something that's going to be intimidating. So much so that the entire army of the Philistines said, "Yeah, just let him do it. You, you go, go whoop him. We'll stand back here." And he had a guy that was helping him. Can you imagine the shield bearer goes before him? So if his didn't say how big the shield was. Can you can imagine? It was bigger than this dude that had the, char the job of carrying it, right? Maybe put it on his back like a backpack. Look like a big, like a beetle walking down, right? Just picture all this stuff. So he comes out and he says, then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you will be our servants and serve us. He's taunting him at this point, right? Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. <laughs> dismayed, greatly afraid. Because this 12-footer is over there challenging them. So David... He was the youngest of four brothers. His three older brothers were involved in the army at some respect. They were all there encamped. And his, David's father's name was Jesse. Had sent him, David was back tending some sheep, that sort of thing. And uh, Jesse sent David, dad sent his son, take some food to your brothers and see how they're doing. Probably look like Go check on him. I want to see how things are really going. So he took some 
and cheese and some other things over there. So David went up there, and uh, while he's doing this, the Philistine drew near and presented himself 40 days, morning and evening. So from the time he started taunting Israel, there's 40 days when he's just up there saying, hey, send somebody over here. You can't beat me. I'm going to whoop you. Keep doing that. 40 days. Israel's armies were afraid, dreadfully afraid. So David was told by his father to go deliver a meal to his obviously bigger, stronger, older, better fighter brothers. He goes up there. And David spoke to the man who stood by him. What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? So picture, little guy, not trained in war, comes up. He's going to go deliver something to three of the soldiers that you're, that you're with, right? All these guys armed out. They're scared of this 12-footer. And this little guy comes up and says, what are you guys scared of? Why are you over here scared? He's a Philistine. He's against God. What are you scared of? Would that make you, well, there's a couple different things that can make you feel. One of those might be anger. Like, who's this kid? Get him out of here. Hey, is that your brother? Get him out of here. Go home to your dad, right? The other thing is like, whoa, maybe he's right. Maybe he's right. Maybe God's with us. Maybe I shouldn't be scared. Or maybe even if I am scared, I should do it anyway. Mm -hmm. So this word gets back to Saul. David's talking to this, these people telling these things, and Saul hears of it. He says, hey, bring him to me. I want to see this little guy. Bring him over to me. He asks him something along the lines of, what are you saying over here? What's going on? And David answers him. He says, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. He just said, look, God's been with me. A bear and a lion have come. Look at me. A bear and a lion have already come to try to get me. God was with me. Here I am. I've got faith. God's with me. I can't lose to this Philistine. Send me out. Now think about the enormity of this decision for, for Saul. Right? We're not just talking about one little runt guy going out there dead, and that, and, oh, well, that was funny. Well, let's see what else happens. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about serious consequences. If you send out your champion to fight their champion, the results of that fight are the results of the war. The loser in that fight, all their people become enslaved. So this isn't just Saul saying, I don't know, kid. I don't want you to get hurt. This is Saul saying, I don't know if I can trust you with the fate of my kingdom. Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. So I'll tell him, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth. He is a man of war from his youth. David sent to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep when a lion and a bear came and took the lamb out of the flock and went out and struck it and delivered its lamb from its mouth. Talking about that story. So next thing, Saul's wanting to give him, okay, let's get you some armor. Let's get you... At least, let's get you some armor and a sword, right? Let's get you, let's get you kitted up. Clothe David with his armor, bronze helmet on his head, 
clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. And he took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook, put them in a shepherd's bag in a pouch which he had, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. I'm not taking the armor. I'm not good with it. It doesn't matter. I don't want a sword. Just give me a slingshot and five, five stones in a pouch and my staff. And Goliath said, David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Right? Right, right? This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with a sword and spear, for the Lord, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Oof. You want to talk about faith. You want to talk about moving in your faith. That's all or nothing. It's 100% God is with me or I'm dead. No in between. Right? You go up against a 12-footer, hundreds, thousands, pounds maybe, this is not looking good for you if God's not with you. So it was when the Philistine arose and came to draw near to meet David that David hurried and ran towards the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone stank Stank. Sank into his forehead. It might have stunk too, but it was just sank into his forehead, and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and ki killed him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. Just a rock and a sling. The power of the Lord. That was our introduction to David. We're talking about the prophecy that he was coming. We talked about his faith in motion. Let's talk about Samson. Strangely enough, this is the this is the thing. In Judges 13, chapter 1, again the children of Israel did evil on the side of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. Very much a different timeline from David, by the way. Different times altogether. This is the time of the judges when we talked about a little bit last week where there's kind of the cycle that Israel gets in, right? They're doing good. They're in good. They're getting blessed. God is with them. They've been delivered. Things are good. They get comfortable. They allow idol worship. They start sliding into old ways. They start turning away from God, and they get punished, and they get put into bondage by their enemies, and they're enslaved, and then they cry out, cry out to God, and God has mercy on them, and raise up a judge to deliver them again. Well, in this cycle, Israel did evil on the side of the Lord, and they've been delivered into the hand of the Philistines. They're crying out to the Lord. God, why are you letting this happen to us? Right? That's where they are in the cycle. And Samson happens to be the next judge that God is sending to do his will, to deliver Israel. So there's a man named Manoah, and he had a wife who was barren, had no children. And then 
the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Indeed, now you are barren and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Here's where it gets interesting. It says, Now therefore, please be careful not to drink wine or similar drink, and not to eat anything unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. So no wine, no haircuts. Right? Setting him up to be a Nazarite, to the Nazarene vow, to be dedicated to the Lord from his birth. From his birth. This is the prophet, prophecy about him coming, and already the angel of the Lord is saying, set him up to be put aside and sanctified and put aside to be a Nazarene from birth. God's going to use this man in a great way before he's even born. God's will was to use him. He goes on, so the angel of the Lord said to Manoah. Now, Manoah is the husband of the wife who was barren. The wife was the one that got spoke to by the angel before. Now the angel said to Manoah, the husband, of that, of all that I have said to the woman, let her be careful. You may not eat anything that comes from the vine, nor may she drink wine or similar drink, nor eat anything unclean. And all that I commanded her, let her observe. So he's saying, hey, this is important. I told your wife what to do, and now I'm telling you, you guys work together. Make sure you don't break this for me. Important instructions from the Lord. And Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, what is your name? That when your words come to pass, we may honor you. And the angel of the Lord said to him, why do you ask me my name? Seeing it is wonderful. So Manoah took the, the young goat with the grain offering. This is took it upon the rock, he offered it upon the rock to the Lord, and he did a wondrous thing while Manoah and his wife looked on. It happened as a flame went up towards heaven from the altar, the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar. And when Manoah and his wife saw this, they fell on, the ground, on their faces to the ground. So it wasn't enough that this angel came and talked to them each individually, gave them direct instructions face to face. He put an exclamation mark on it. He gave his signature on it. He said, this is the angel of the Lord. So Manoah had figured something big's going on here. I'm going to make an offering. He puts it on there. The offering is up in fire, and the angel of the Lord that was talking to him ascends in the smoke up to heaven. And him and his wife looking at it. And he goes on to say that, I think his wife is the one that said, surely we're going to die for we've seen the Lord. And he says, if God wanted us dead, he would have killed us already. Sean's Cliff Notes version. But that's what happened. So he told them each face to face and gave them a miracle to prove it, to say that it was me. So the woman bore a son and called him his name Samson. And the child grew and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move upon him at Manea, Dan, between Zorah and Eshtal. Now, I want you to notice and just focus on the fact that Samson isn't even born when these things start to move in motion for him. So the concept of us being vessels us being a, a, a jar in the potter's hand is in motion here. God made up his mind. He was going to use Samson before Samson even knew that Samson was Samson at all. Before there's any self-awareness, before there's any breath in his lungs, God knew he was going to use him in a ma major way. Some of the things that we learn, we get introduced to him. The next chapter in Judges, this is in 14, 
So he went up and told his father and mother, I have seen a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me as a wife. Now, he wasn't supposed to take a wife from the Philistines. Now, though it's not clear, there's a chance that as a Nazarene, he might not have, had, might not have been allowed to take a wife at all. It's not clear. But he is rebellious, at least. Maybe, I'm not sure the word spontaneous is the right word. The word here where he's impulsive. Thank you. Exactly. See, that's why I keep you around. <laughs> Super impulsive, doesn't have a lot of self-control. Says, I want that one. Later on in 14, it says specifically, then the spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily and he went down to Ashtalon and killed 30 of their men and took their apparel and gave the changes of clothing to those who explained the riddle to his anger. His anger was aroused and he went back up to his father's house. So this, remember, he, he gave a riddle to these people and said, if I win, I get this amount of clothing. If you win, you get this amount of clothing. And then the wife said, hey, what's the answer? And he, she gave, him, gave them the answer. And so God used him to punish those Philistines. And it actually says that God used him in that regard. And on the surface, this seems like Samson saying, okay, I'm offended. I'm going to go kill a bunch of people. That was part of what happened. The Bible actually says that God was using him to get closer to the Philistines to, to punish them. So God's using him as a vessel, even though he's doing this out of his own offense. God's will to use him in this regard, he used all things for good. He used him in this regard to punish those Philistines. But the thing that you want to notice here is it begins with saying, then the Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily. That's where Samson's strength came from, the Spirit of the Lord. Later on, the next chapter in 15 tells the story. But they said to him, we have come down to arrest you. We may deliver you into the hands of the Philistines. So these are Israeli soldiers, if you will. They're coming down saying, hey, these guys are really angry with us. And they said they're going to attack us unless we deliver you, Samson, to them. We're going to take you and hand them over. We're going to extradite you for our sakes. And he says, then Samson said to them, swear to me you will not kill me yourselves. To the, to the soldiers and the policemen that are coming to arrest him. He says, just don't kill me. Fine. Take me to him. Just don't kill me. So they spoke to him saying, no, we won't kill you but we will surely tie you securely and deliver you into their hand, but we will surely not kill you. And they bound him with two new ropes and brought him up from the rock. When he came to Lehi, the Philistines came, shouting against him. Then the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. The Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. And the ropes that were on his arms became like flax that was burned with fire and his bonds broke. Broke loose from his hands. He found a fresh jawbone out of, from a donkey, reached out his hand, took it, and killed a thousand men with it. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him. That's where his strength came from. His motives weren't always pure. In fact, most of the time, they weren't. God used them anyway. It was God's plan for this vessel in his life that he was going to use them despite his shortcomings, despite his failures, and despite his bad decisions and wrong intentions, God used them anyway. David. Bathsheba. 
for Samuel 11 too. When, then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from his roof, he saw a woman bathing and the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman and someone said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers and took her and she came to him and he lay with her. She was cleansed from her impurity and she returned to her house. And the woman conceived... So she sent and told David and said, I am with child. David prophesied from the beginning. He's a man after God's own heart. He wasn't perfect. Far from it. He goes on to try to hide the fact that Bathsheba got pregnant. He brings Uriah back from the battle, and first he says, hey, Uriah, go spend some time with your wife. Go spend the night in your house, and let's make it seem like this baby's yours. It's on the Cliff Notes version, right? So Uriah says, you know, there's a battle going on out there, and my brethren are out there dying. I don't feel right spending a nice comfy night with my wife. I'm going to sleep here by the steps of the palace. David's like, ah, all you got to do, one job, one job, go do it. Just stay another night. And again, he refuses. So then his cover-up plan didn't work. David's plan to cover it up and make it seem like this pregnancy was from Uriah didn't work. So David sends, his people say, okay, let's send Uriah out to the front lines. And when it gets... When it gets heated, let's send him to the very front. Kind of picture everybody else should step back. And let's make sure he gets hit with an arrow. Let's make sure he gets killed. So all of a sudden, this man who was prophesied to be a man after God's own heart has essentially committed murder. He's coveted his neighbor's wife. He's committed adultery. And fornication. And some people even say, depending on the time and everything else, that what he did with Bathsheba might have been classified as rape. Let that sink in a little bit. Different when you're the king, I guess. That's not biblical. It doesn't say that specifically. But it's an interesting thought to go down. So this man made some serious mistakes, made some serious blunders, serious sin. And this plan worked. Uriah was killed. So then he took took her as a wife. It says, when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when her mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house. And she became his wife and bore him a son. The thing that David had done displeased the Lord. If there's ever an understatement in the Bible, that would be it, I think. David fell short. David fell short. Let's see how Samson fell short. Starts in Judges 1. Samson went to Gaza, hired a prostitute. He went on, took a different woman, his wife, a woman named Delilah, which is going to be his downfall. The Lord of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, entice him, find out where his great strength lies, and by what means we may overpower him, that we may bind him to afflict him, and every one of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, please tell me where your great strength lies, and with what you may be bound to afflict you. And I'm sure you've heard the story. This happens a few times. Each time he, first few times he lies to her, says, yeah, new ropes, that'll do it. You can bind me up. And then she calls in her buddies. Philistines come, hey, he's temp bound up, and he breaks the ropes, kills them all. Happens again. Kills them all. Then the last time, you know, I talk about a picture 
kind of a nagging wife in this, right? She, let me just read here. Then she said to him, how can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times and have not told me where your great strength lies. And it came to pass when she pestered him daily with her words and pressed him so that his soul was vexed to death. Wow. Vexed to death. That he told her all of his heart. He said to her, he told her the truth this time, no razor has ever come upon my head, for I haven't been a Nazarite from God from my mother's womb. If I am shaven, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. So, what does she do with this information? Keeps it to herself. Keeps him safe. Keeps the secret between a man and a woman. No, that's not what happened. And Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart. She sent out and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up once more, for he has told me all his heart. So the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in her hand. Then she lulled him to sleep on her knees. She's sitting there, his head on her knees, just laying there. Called for a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. And she began to torment him, and his strength left him. Thanks, wife. She said to the Philistines, and then she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he woke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before in other times, and I shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. The Lord had departed from him. The strength that he had came from the Lord. And when the symbol, the faith in motion that his parents put in place of not having a razor touch his head. When that was broken, the Spirit of the Lord left him. And the Philistine took him, and put out his eyes, poked him out, couldn't see anymore, and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze fetters, and he became a grinder in the prison. However, the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaven. I'm sure we all know how this ends. And Samson said to the lad who led him by the hand, let me feel the pillars which support the temper, temple so I can lean on them. Remember, he's been brought from prison so that he might entertain the Philistines. Be the entertainment so they can make fun of him. They can mock him some more. This was the, the champion, the judge of Israel that had made all these people die unalive, right? Unalived them all, thousands. He's blind, being led by a little guy, no longer strong. They're going to tie him up to two pillars, and he used to say, just let my hands touch the pillars so I can feel them. And you can kind of say, oh, okay, why not? What's it going to hurt? Tie him up there. The temple was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there, about 3,000 men and women on the roof, watching while Samson performed. Then Samson called to the Lord saying, O oh Lord God, remember me. Remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray. Just this once, O oh God, that I might with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars which supported the temple, braced himself against him, one on his right and the other on his left. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed with all his might and the temple fell on the lords and all the people who were in it, so that the dead that he killed at his death were more than he killed in his life. God used Samson, even though Samson's motives were selfish along the way. There's a question you have to ask, how much more could God have used Samson 
if his heart were in the right place. Nowhere in this story, except for maybe his last words, does it show any picture of Samson repenting. Repentance is not part of this man's life. You ever seen a college athlete who's going to get ready to go to the draft, go to the pros? You think, this person has it all as far as his athletics career goes, right? This person has been basically, if it's basketball, he's bouncing a basketball since basically before he could walk, right? He's got the physical build for it. He's had everything just basically given to him. You know, he got the easy classes in high school and the coaches, the the teachers maybe look the other way, let him go. Gets to college, same kind of thing. You know, you know, let's let's help you pass. Let's get you on the let's, whatever it takes to keep you on the court. Right? You see all this amazing potential, and they make a really stupid mistake. They go and get drunk and drive, kill somebody, shoot somebody, make make mistakes with drugs so they fail drug tests and, and ruin their career. You see this, the cockiness that comes behind that, the arrogance that's there, because ever since they were this tall, they were told they're amazing, everything's going to work out great, and every time they've made mistakes along the way, it gets shoved under the rug, they've been made excuses for, given the easy way. From birth, Samson was set up to be a champion for God. He had this strength that was superhuman, stronger than anybody else. Things went okay for Samson along those lines, Granted, he didn't have great luck with wives, but he was revered as some kind of a superhuman. So you have to think that he was that college athlete going into the pros. He had that attitude. Nothing can hurt me because of who I am. It wasn't from repentance. It wasn't from building a relationship with the Lord. It was arrogance. But in his death, You can kind of see his heart turned. And while it doesn't actually show complete repentance, it's a turn to the Lord saying, one last time, Lord. One last time. He's at least giving it to God and saying, this is you. He's acknowledging, God, this is you. This was your strength. One last time, Lord. Now with David, it's a different story. Give you the Cliff Notes version. So there was a prophet named Nathan. Nathan heard from the Lord. He had to go talk to the king. That king was David. Nathan told David a story about how there was a traveler that came and there was a poor man that had one sheep, loved it like a pet. And that man took that one sheep, although he had hundreds of his own, he took the poor man's sheep and slaughtered it and ate it. Cliff, no, Cliff Notes version. For sake of time. And he tells him this story, and David's anger is aroused. He says, well, this man's going to die. Just tell me who this man is that did this, this wrong thing, and I'll have him killed. And Nathan says those famous words, you are that man. You are that man. So Nathan, prompted by the Holy Spirit, bypassed David's defenses, bypassed that king and subject relationship, and was able to tell him, your highness, you're the man. So had that been Samson, his reaction would have been rage. He would have killed a 1,000 people with a jawbone. But David took the lesson. David repented. David heard and changed. Samuel 12, 13. So David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. To him, to raise him up from the ground, but he would not nor did he eat food with them. Then on the seventh day, it came to pass that the child died. 
And the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, indeed, while the child was alive, we spoke to him, and he would not heed our voice. How can we tell him that the child is dead? He may do some harm. While the child was alive, David wouldn't listen to us. He wouldn't even acknowledge that we were there. How are we going to tell him? How are we going to tell this king that his son is dead? The child, I guess I didn't say son, but the child is dead. He may hurt us. He may do some harm. But David didn't do that. David repented, and he got up. He basically said, I'm going to be with him. He showed him his faith. But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. So he's showing his faith that eventually he's going to go to heaven. He's going to see his son again, says him. The child is a him. He's going to see his son again, showing that faith. So here's the thing. The thing I started with saying, God showed me the main difference between these two men and their stories. It's not going to be a a huge surprise, but it was a bit of a surprise for me as I was putting these things together, contrasting these two men's stories. You know, Samson was arrogant, thought it was him, did not repent, did not fix the relationship with the Lord until the very end when it was too little too late. And God basically used him as a vessel and even kept God's promise based on his hair because remember it was growing out a little bit. Right? But along the way, Samson did not care what God thought about those, what God thought about him. He did not rebuild, repent, or fix the relationship between him and God. God used him anyway because it was God's will. But David, David screwed up in a major way. But along the way, he repented. He fell on his face. He pleaded with the Lord. He worked on that relationship. We need a relationship with the Lord. We shouldn't be acting in a matter that's just, okay, what are the rules? I need to follow them. What's what's the next rule? I'm not going to break those rules for the sake of trouble, for the sake of punishment. We should be at a place where if I do something wrong, it's going to break my daddy's heart. That relationship is where we need to be. David was a man after God's own heart. He was moving in faith towards God, repairing and building that relationship. Samson didn't. Both are listed as heroes of the faith because they did what they were supposed to do. But David's a man after God's own heart. See, he worked on that relationship. He repented. He softened his heart. Samson's results was he was able to take out thousands of enemies on his way out. David's results was a promise from the Lord that from his seed, he was going to build up his new kingdom. Jesus was going to come from the seed of David. His descendants were going to be used in a major way. So instead of a thousand enemies on his way out, he had millions of descendants serving the Lord of that relationship. Think of what God could have done with Samson if he had that relationship. We give it all to the Lord. We're his vessels. He's the potter, we're the clay. That's where we need to be. But along the way, we need to try to build that relationship, repair it. If we've done something that's hurt God, we need to apologize. We need to repent. We need to turn from 180 degrees and turn the other way and make it no longer a part of our lives which is the essence of repentance. Repair that relationship. 
go see her daddy. So that's the difference in the relationship. Thank you, God, that we can have that relationship. Thank you, God, that even though we're not perfect, you can use us in a major way. Help us to never be in a place where someone would ask, how much more could God use Sean, Crystal, Wendell? How much more could God use them if they had a better relationship or if they'd repented or if they'd listened to the Lord? Help us not to be in that position, Lord. Help us to hear and walk in faith. Thank you, Jesus. All right, so we have some volunteers to pass out communion. Julie, did you pick somebody? All right. Thank you, boys. Appreciate you. Yep. Sorry. Don't break them. Just show them, don't give them to people and they'll break them themselves. Okay? Good job, boys. In light of all that, their imperfections, <clears throat> all the many things that David did, God called him a man of, after his own heart. God knew what he was going to do. Gives us a little bit of hope. You know, none of us are perfect. At that 